to begin with, in 1915, Lenin described capitalism, the continuation of capitalism, as horror without end. Today, that statement is arguably even more true than when Lenin wrote it in the midst of the First World War. The world as a whole has not been at peace since 1914. There's been a war somewhere in the world since 1914. And since then, we've seen the indescribable horrors of the Holocaust, the dropping of nuclear weapons on, on Japan, the indiscriminate napalm bombing of civilians. I could go on and on. Um, 30 years ago, however, we were actually promised the end of war, along with the end of history. When the USSR collapsed with the end of the Cold War, The Economist magazine, so a you know, Western pro-capitalist publication, predicted what it called a peace dividend, and it actually published articles speculating on what are we going to use all the money for? When we no longer have to invest in arms production, and we're no longer wasting resources on arms, perhaps we'll be able to find a cure for cancer, and so on and so forth. Obviously, that's not what we got, was it? from the end of history. What we got was the breakup of Yugoslavia with the ensuing carnage, atrocities like the Rwandan genocide, and uh, a series of disastrous wars in the Middle East, which have left parts of the region a ruin. And that's not even mentioning the, the continued uh, occupation of Palestine by, by the Israeli state. War, in fact, has, if anything, been elevated to a permanent ubiquitous state under the so-called war on terror where basically any country on earth could be drone bombed from above without a moment's notice. And now, with the war unfolding in Ukraine and the tensions between China and America rising over the question of Taiwan, the war drums are beating again all over the world, and including here in Britain. But why is it that war is such, seems to be such an inescapable feature of the society in which we live? For some people, man's inhumanity to man is its own explanation. We, we kill each other, we bomb each other because we can't help it, or even because we want to, we like to. But such a purely moralizing approach is not only wrong on the facts, in my opinion, it actually offers us no guide to how we can struggle to end war. In fact, it rejects that struggle as utopian. That's not the Marxist standpoint, however, as I'm sure you can already tell. As Clausewitz famously said, war is the continuation of politics by other means. And politics is ultimately the expression of the struggle between social classes. And it's on, on that principle that we base ourselves. War today is not the, simply the same as war between different tribes throughout history and prehistory, or even the same as the Roman conquests. It's an inherent and necessary feature of the social system in which we live, capitalism. And in particular, capitalism in the period of its senile decay. So we can't understand war today, and, and wars like the war in Ukraine uh, in particular, without understanding the nature of imperialism. Now, I think most, peop most people would acknowledge that there is a link between war and imperialism, but I tend to find that imperialism is, is more colloquially defined as an aggressive policy of conquest and annexations. The problem with that is it doesn't take us very far at all. It essentially amounts to saying that states invade one another because they decide to, because they have the policy of invading one another. It's a bit of a, a tautological definition, really. And in order to look more deeply into this question, we actually have to look at the objective social forces and class res, uh, relations which drive states to fight these wars in the, per, in the first place. That's how we can get to the roots of this problem. And that's something that Lenin did in his masterpiece, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, which was published, uh, written in the mid of the First World War in 1916. Now, when the First World War broke out in 1914, it shattered the existing Socialist International with almost all of the national sections of that international, which was nominally based on Marxism, all of them basically um, finding one reason or other, one justification or other, um, for supporting their own imperialist bourgeoisie. Only the Serbian and Russian parties think possibly one more, um, opposed the war at its outbreak. And the, the genuine Marxists and internationalists found themselves extremely in, uh, isolated at that time. And in those conditions of isolation, Lenin turned to a theoretical understanding of the essential character of imperialism to lay the basis for a new revolutionary movement. And it's his, his conclusions are as relevant today as when they were written. So Lenin actually begins his analysis, and this is where I'll begin my analysis as well, following Lenin, not on the political forms of imperialism, but on its economic base, which he found in the rise of monopoly capitalism. Now, under capitalism, we're often told the market is made up of various different capitalist enterprises who are all in competition with each other in the market. Now, the extent to which free competition has ever existed in the capitalism is debatable. You know, it, it, it differs by degree. But in the course of the 19th century, one thing we do see clearly is a fundamental turning point where, where 
free competition, capitalist competition, actually turns into its opposite. It actually becomes capitalist monopoly. And the reasons for this, well, there are various reasons for this, but fundamentally, as capitalism develops the productive forces, we, start to start, we started to see the merger of smaller capitalist enterprises and things called, such as joint stock companies in order to take up larger, more technologically advanced projects, such as, I mean, back in the day, things like railway construction, new chemical industries, things like that. Now, this actually started to raise a higher and higher barrier in terms of the level of investment required in order for new players to get in on the game. Gone were the days where some, you know, um, entrepreneur could effectively set up a coal mine or build a canal and start to compete with his fellow capitalists. Actually, the market was beginning to be restricted just by the development of the productive forces under capitalism. Um, and, but in addition to that, in the inevitable crises of overproduction that struck the system, inevitably the smaller, weaker enterprises would fail or be swallowed up by the larger, which contributed to accelerating the process of monopolization that was already beginning. And from the crisis in the early 1870s onwards, you start to see quite a rapid formation of what at the time was called trusts or cartels. So for example, price fixing rings between large corporations, and especially the fusion of even entire different industries under a single capitalist entity. In Germany, especially in the Ruhr Valley, they had these things called concerner, I think is how you pronounce it, apologies if, if I got it wrong, where basically you had a single monopoly that controlled not only coal mining, but steel production. Basically every stage in that productive process was owned, controlled, regulated, managed, for the greatest profitability and efficiency. And obviously these gigantic monopolies are able to drive their rivals out of competition but by, for example, selling at even below their value, their, their commodities are even below their value, driving the competition out of business or simply mergers and acquisitions. I mean, Microsoft, what has Microsoft produced since the 1990s? I'm not aware of anything. They simply just update the same software and buy out all competition to establish a monopoly position on the market. And this process of monopolization is even more stark today than when Lenin was writing, and certainly since the 1870s. Um, so just to give a couple of examples, because I have to move on. Every, pretty much every consumer product that you will ever buy will be owned and produced by one of 10 global monopolies. That's it. You might have even seen on the, the internet, there's a very good diagram, in my opinion, where in the center of a circle, there's these 10 companies, and then literally every single consumer brand you could possibly recognize spanning out from all of them. So often, if you, you know, there's this idea that under capitalism, the reason capitalism is superior to socialism, you have consumer choice, right? That if, if somebody's producing a bad product, you can choose to buy it off someone else. Actually, when you're looking at the shop shelves and you're deciding which, which chocolate bar do I want, usually you're basically just choosing between different faces of exactly the same company. Um, and this is, this is not just the case in consumer products. In, I saw one statistic that a single Taiwanese company, TSMC, accounts for 54% of all microprocessor production, not in Taiwan, or even in China as a whole, but in the entire world economy. So a majority of the world's production of a single product is taken up by one um, country. And I think the island of Taiwan actually accounts for over 90% of semiconductor production. This is the, the intensity of this concentration and centralization of capital that's taken place. And hand in hand with this industrial monopolization comes the rise of what Lenin describes as finance capital. Now, banking in one form or another and finance has been present through the evolution of capitalism from its very, very earlier stages. But earlier in capitalism's development, the banks more served as a, they, they didn't dominate and drive the economy. They served more as the role of middlemen. Uh, you know, surplus, uh, the surplus accrued, profits accrued by the capitalists that couldn't be immediately reinvested in production were pooled effectively um, in, in the forms of these banks that would then lend it out at a profit, which played a, a progressive role in the development of the capitalist economy. But with the accumulation of capital which is going on in this period and the concentration of capital as well. This excess of this surplus profit um, accumulating actually gives the banks an increasingly central role in the economy itself. The level of investment that is required to go into these you know, larger, more advanced projects that I talked about actually started giving the banks an extremely important position in lending out capital. And eventually, the banks actually start buying up controlling shares in the very industrial companies and the monopolies I talked about. What we see is a fusion. Finance capital is not simply high finance. Finance capital is the fusion with the of the banks with industry. That the banks actually start to become the dominant capitalists 
in the world. And of course, again, this process has only intensified in our own era, where we see the number of gigantic banks, which effectively are now the nerve centers of the economy and dominate the economy, has shrunk in relation to when Lenin was writing. Um, but also, the, the banks have acquired a too big to fail status. And we saw this in 2008, where a crisis which was triggered by the rampant speculation of the banks um, ended up, the, the banks themselves, having caused the crisis, were bailed out by the state because they were considered too big to fail. And what that meant was if they collapsed, the entire economy would go with them. And if the American economy went, the world economy would have gone. Um, all this underlines another important feature, that, and that is actually the fusion of the state with finance capital and the interests of finance capital. That one interesting feature of 2008 is when the Barack Obama, newly elected Obama government was discussing what to do, a representative of Goldman Sachs, a gigantic bank, was actually in the room. This is somebody who was personally directly responsible for the crisis, telling them exactly how much money they needed to give him and his company in order to keep the economy running. And that, that is completely logical. From a Marxist point of view of how the state works, that is completely logical. A bourgeois state is based on bourgeois property. It's based on the interests and property of its own bourgeoisie, its own capitalist class. If that class has become increasingly concentrated into the monopolies and dominant banks, then can a capitalist state really act outside of the, the interests and the wills of these monopolies? Um, I would say not. And we see that today where the markets effectively decide who and who is not in government. I have absolutely no sympathy with Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng, but they, they, un, they learned to their detriment the power of the, the markets and finance capital under capitalism today. But I've only spoken really about a situation within a given country. But the, the capitalism is an international system. And the international cap, cap, uh, character of the capitalist market and capital, uh, capitalist production means that these monopolies I talked about show tendency actually to, to grow beyond their, international, their national borders into international monopolies and trusts, which basically carve up the world economy between themselves. The EU is actually a very good example of that. Ironically, the, the first kind of incarnation of the EU was the European coal and steel community. And they, when they introduced it, they intended it to be a free trade area and they broke up the major monopolies like the German concerner. But 20 years later, they were all back. The monopolies were back, price fixing was back, and the, the Euro European coal and steel community basically became a gigantic, now European-wide coal and steel cartel. That shows that this is not simply a question of a policy, but this is actually ingrained within the nature of capitalist production today. Um, but even more significant was something that Lenin called the export of capital. Now, capital by its very nature, you know, what is capital? Marx called it self-valorizing value, a quantity of value, money, for instance, usually money, which transforms itself into a greater quantity of value. Again, let's say money. Um, but in order to do that, that requires markets to sell one's goods. It requires resources, workers to exploit. In other words, new fields for exploitation. Now, this inevitably provokes competition, not only between capitalist enterprises, but also between capitalist states and national markets. But with the accumulation and concentration of capital um, in the hands of a few monopolists and big banks. The surplus capital being accumulated is simply too great for the limitations of the national market. Not only the buying power of the masses within that market is restricted and you need to export goods, but even more important actually, the, 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 the rate of profits available in that market and the, um, the, the possibilities for fresh profitable investment are greatly reduced. And so we start to see actually these gigantic monopolies and banks exporting capital to other usually less developed countries in order to buy up resources. For example, the buying up of mines in Africa, Latin America by European or other imperialist countries. Um, and the, uh, the reduction of the local po population to workers living on, if anything, below the breadline and uh, turned into uh, basically producing surps, super, super profits sorry, for these capitalist imperialists, or imperialist capitalists rather. Um, and to give just one example, like the most obvious example or a very stark example, you might have heard of the country Zimbabwe. What you might not know is that prior to being called Zimbabwe, it was part of what was called Rhodesia. Now, Rhodesia was named after a single British individual called Cecil Rhodes, who was a gigantic mining magnate, a monopolist, whose company, whose mining company, literally took over what is now Zimbabwe in order to uh, uh, um, achieve for himself a monopoly over diamond production. So a single billionaire monopolist basically taking over a country uh, as a field for investment. That's kind of the most, that's almost like the idea of Elon Musk setting up a country or taking over a country, sorry, and calling it Muskia. That is the kind of scale that things can reach. It doesn't have to be like that though. It doesn't have to take place in the form of direct conquest because actually today, we still see imperialists intervening in order to ensure their economic interest. But the economic domination 
of the, uh, you know, the, the, the former colonies, semi-colonies, takes place just as surely, to be honest, through um, foreign investment and through debt and even so-called foreign aid. You have this situation where countries such, I mean, you know, name any country really in, uh, in Africa, but countries like Ghana, who are very heavily indebted, not only to foreign states, but also to foreign corporations and foreign banks. And if, if they find themselves unable to pay back that debt, which is, of course, very difficult when their national assets are owned by foreign companies, if they're unable to pay it back, the, I, the International Monetary Fund comes in, gives them a loan to stabilize things, and in return, they have to basically privatize sorry, even more of their national wealth. Who buys up that national wealth? Is it small-time investors in Ghana? I don't think so. Usually, it's foreign imperialists. It doesn't just happen in Africa in the so-called third world. It effectively happened to Greece, where Greece, in return for support from the, the, what was called the Troika, um, effectively had to sell up its national wealth to various different foreign investors. This is imperialism in action. It doesn't necessarily have to establish a formal political colony, although that has often been the form it's taken. And it's uh, not, not just in, in Greece. I mean, to, to speak about the EU again briefly, when it was founded, one of the founding declarations is called the Schuman Declaration, based on a, a French minister, foreign minister. And in it, he said, oh, the purpose is to stop war in Europe, a war which would have been impossible because of the weakness of the European powers and the presence of the American military, but still, nice, nice sentiment. But more importantly, he said, with the fusion of our resources, Europe can achieve its primary task, namely the development of Africa. Now, when a French, no, no, let's be fair to the French, when a European minister talks about the development of Africa, I think we have some kind of inkling based on history what exactly he means. That is the real purpose of these imperialist trade blocks. Um, and institutions like the World Bank, the IMF, and the World Trade Organization are, are just as imperialist institutions than the Pentagon. For example, it's not simply a, mon a military phenomenon. Fundamentally, it's an economic phenomenon. Politics is the most concentrated expression of economics. And the export of capital abroad eventually necessitates some form of growing military power and military intervention from the imperialist state, not only to protect its interests from the, the locals if they try to rise up, um, but also to secure its spheres of influence um, and, and spheres of investment from the intervention of other powers. Uh, the scramble for Africa is an example of that. And often you see regime change and, and, and squabbling over resource-rich uh, countries. For instance, the attempt to overthrow the Bolivian regime, which sits on very important lithium reserves, very important for the production of car batteries. Now, I don't want to oversimplify things and make it sound like every single imperialist war is solely fought over the grabbing of markets and investment uh, and, and resources. It is possible for imperialists to fight a war simply to defend, uh, you know, for a purely military defensive position, uh, to, to maintain a buffer state, but also even for the sake of prestige, that an imperialist power, if they seem to be declining and they lose a sphere of influence, they worry, well, what, what's the impact on all my other colonies or semi-colonies going to have? It's not quite as simple as it's just purely about economics, but usually the imperialist states will commit military resources in order to guard ultimately the profits of their own imperialists. And there are many, many examples of that. Well, this means that war is absolutely inevitable. Under, under a social system like this, war is inevitable. Not only wars of so-called regime change and effectively colonial wars to subjugate part of the world, that might take the form of just a direct annexation, Nowadays, it tends to be things like peacekeeping forces being sent to countries like Haiti, for example, to keep the peace. What does the peace mean exactly? It means keep maintain order in the interest of the dominant imperialist power or special military operations or something like this. It's still a continuation of war. But in addition to that, you also now have the prospect of wars in bet between the world powers themselves, things like world wars. And this is precisely what led to some something like World War I. German imperialism... Um, it was later onto the stage, it was a younger um, capitalist indus industrial power. It was actually more efficient, if anything, and stronger than the older powers like France and Britain. But the problem is it was already cramped in by the division of the world that had taken place between the, the, the pre-existing powers. It had come too late, basically, to, uh, to, to gobble up as much of the world as it liked. This poses a bit of a contradiction. How is German capitalism supposed to continue developing? And a capitalist, it's like a shark. It must keep moving and it must keep devouring, otherwise it will enter into crisis. So either German capitalism has to go into a huge crisis and readapt itself to the straitjacket basically imposed on it by the other powers, or it has to break that straitjacket, which means ultimately, in, in, in the case of World War I, pushing to the east against the decrepit Russian Empire, but also snatching colonies from the declining French imperialism. The basis of that war was laid in the very nature of capitalism itself. But perhaps most important of all, Lenin concludes that imperialism is not simply a policy which could be changed depending on who the government is, or you know, is, uh, is, it depends on how democratic the regime is or something like that. You know, a fascist regime, that's imperialist, but a democratic regime, no, that's different. Now, he says that imperialism is an inevitable stage in the development of capitalism itself.
It is, uh, what it actually expresses is the fundamental contradiction of a system in which production is more and more socialized and yet appropriation is on a private, individual basis, but also confined to the now barbarous limitations of the bourgeois nation state. It's a gigantic social contradiction. But that, that means not only that brutal wars are a, uh, inevitable under capitalism, but it also means that imperialism is not just a policy, but also it's not simply a fixed relation between specific countries or states for all times, that you have the rise of imperialism in the form of Britain, France, and then the rest of the world remains colonies or semi-colonies. That's obviously not what's happened in, in history. The very fact that imperialism is a stage in the development of capitalism makes it inevitable that newer capitalist powers will arise on the basis of their own capitalist development. Germany and the United States are obvious examples of that. Imperial Japan is an example of that. And today we have in the form of Russia and China states that, I mean, Russia was an imperialist power, but an extremely backward one, both at one point worker states, and on the basis of the revolutions that gave birth to those worker states, actually managed to, in the case of China, unify the uh, country, develop the productive forces, build up industry, um, and actually a, a certain industrial power for themselves, and on the basis of restored capitalism in countries like Russia, if, a, if you have a capitalist nation so large and powerful with such huge powerful monopolies, is it not inevitable at a certain point that those monopolies will want to acquire new markets and spheres of influence? Is it not inevitable that they want to invest and export their surplus capital into other countries, regardless of the history up until that point? I would say it is. It, isn't it inbuilt in the nature of capitalist production? Um, and we're starting to see in, in Venezuela, for example, Venezuela is trying to turn away from American imperialism because it's under constant attack from American imperialism. And they're cutting deals with Russian mining monopolies for some of the mining wealth in, in the Venezuelan Andes. We see plenty of examples of China, for example, lending out uh, capital, big lending um, huge amounts often to states under the Belt and Road Initiative, um, lending it interest, for example. Our, our, our Pakistani comrades told me an example of where a, a factory was to be set up with a loan from China. The, the loan was lent out at 14%. And one of the conditions of the loan is they had to buy the machinery that was going to go into the uh, factory from China. And the, 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 this is now a secondary feature, but the, the machinery they sold the pa factory in Pakistan was basically knackered second-hand machinery. And so they ended up having to effectively pay twice. This is a small example of imperialism because it is the nature of capitalism itself. Um, and, and so actually, th this also is, is an important piece of context for the wars and tensions that are starting to arise. The war in Ukraine is not an isolated conflict between Ukraine and Russia as it's being presented here, which is, you know, poor little Ukraine versus Russian imperialism. Ukraine is a proxy war between the NATO alliance. Some of you have gone to the NATO talk, but a, a, a military alliance with American imperialism right at the center also fundamentally representing the interests of American imperialism, fighting collectively in order to push back um, Russian uh, you know, Russia from its own kind of sphere of influence in order to achieve uh, greater influence in Ukraine. Incidentally, I, I even after I prepared this lead-off, I heard on the radio that Ukraine happens to be one of the top five reserves for rare earth materials, which is an extremely important resource. And that last year, Europe signed a, an agreement for the exploitation of those resources. Unfortunately for Europe, most of those are found in the east of the country. That might be one of the reasons why Europe is particularly invested in the defense of Ukrainian democracy, whatever that is. That might also be that Putin has his own idea of a fraternal relationship with those uh, rare earth materials. We'll have to see how the war pans out. But this is that you can't really understand why this war is even taking place without understanding the nature of imperialism. And so that's how things really stand. But is that how it's actually presented at the time when war is breaking out? Of course not. And in every single war, the imperialist nations taking place present things underneath these vague, abstract, seemingly absolute, absolute unquestionable moral principles. And that is deliberate by the way, because one of the purposes and effects of the declaration of war and war and imperialism is to secure a certain degree of class peace so that they can prosecute the war, but also for its own sake. Sometimes they declare war in order to gain the class peace at home, often with disastrous circumstances. And th 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 these kind of vague hypocritical phrases are used in order to confuse the workers, rally the mass of the population around this state in order to wage the war. And I just want to give some examples, which of course is, is reactionary both in intent and in its implications. Just to give an example here in Britain, the RMT, which is the tra rail transport, the transport workers union, went on strike over something completely unrelated. It was over wages and conditions. And the Telegraph, a Tory paper, said that they were Putin apologists. Because that's the climate as well. Well, we're fighting for Ukraine, aren't we? We were supporting Ukraine against Russia, and you're there harming the world. Well, don't you know there's a war on? How dare you? You're actually making it more difficult for us to support Ukraine. Um, at, at the same time, lots of celebrities and politicians in, in Europe, in America, all over the Western world are saying, like, 
The rising price of inflation is the price we're paying for freedom in Ukraine. First of all, they're trying to link the crisis solely to the war in Ukraine, which is a lie. But also, they're basically trying to say all the suffering that we are inflicting on you for the sake of our profits is actually a bond of fraternal brotherhood with the people of Ukraine. And that's deliberately intended, as I'm sure you can work out yourselves, to lull the workers, confuse the workers, and actually cut across the class struggle at home to make life easier for the imperialists at home. And some of these, I don't really have time to go into detail about these, but so I'm sure you've heard things, the aggressor, whoever started it, therefore is the kind of the evil party and it's the task of all kind of sensible democratic nations in order to defeat that power. It's almost like war is reduced to a schoolyard fight. In fact, most teachers would know not to really be that interested in who started it. But here's the question. It's very, often it's very, very difficult to work out who the aggressor is. In relation to Ukraine, obviously Putin launched the invasion, but the Russians say we're intervening in a civil war that's been going on for eight years. That's not false, is it? There has been a civil war in which both Russia and NATO have been intervening themselves. Where do we lay the blame if it's simply a question of laying the moral blame? Here's a bigger question. Who was the aggressor in World War I? Go on, Alberta, who was the aggressor in World War I? Austria. 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 After a member of their ruling family has been assassinated by terrorists, they have no right. Does Austria not have the right to defend itself, Pascal? <laughs> And, and, you know, they present a perfectly reasonable ultimatum to Serbia, who's harboring these terrorists, just like the Taliban with Afghanistan or Saddam Hussein in Iraq. And then, of course, what choice do they have but to take decisive action against this terror? <laughs> who, they hate our way of life. They hate our Austrian democracy, whatever that was at the time. <laughs> they hate our Austrian Germanic civilization. And they need to be put under heel. Meanwhile, if you're in Russia, surely we have to defend our Slavic brothers. World War I... I when we look back at history, and even in, in, even in British schools, World War I is taught well, fundamentally as an imperialist war, that they say Germany needed colonies and so on, and that Britain was in its way and France was in its way. But we need to remember, comrades, that that's not how it was presented at the time. Just because it, at this distance we can look at it in those terms, it doesn't mean that that's how it's presented. What you might not know is that World War I was fought for the defense of small nations and the right to self-determination. It might sound odd now, but Russia was only fighting to defend the right of the South Slavs against Austrian aggression. Meanwhile, Germany was only fighting for poor Poland against Russian despotism, wasn't it? And Britain? What about poor Belgium? What about the national sovereignty and independence of poor little Belgium? Poor little Belgium, of course, which was massacring and maiming, maiming 10 million Congolese in one, one of the largest, most vicious colonies on the planet. But still, they were neutral, weren't they? <laughs> and wasn't it German aggression? Weren't the Germans the aggressors in that war, therefore? We can go around in circles all day. I could spend the rest of this lead off just repeating all of the lies and nonsense churned out by the European imperialists to justify a war that they'd intended to launch years before. They'd intended to launch that war as early as basically the turn of the 20th century. And they knew it because they knew that that's where their interests fundamentally lay. They were all the aggressor. <laughs> And so, you know, self-determination, the, 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 the communists at the time, or the true internationalists, pointed out that the small nations are always just loose change to these imperialists. Look at the way that, that Yugoslavia was broken up between various different imperialist powers and look at the impact of that on humanity. Is that really the defense of self-determination of nations? Self-defense. How many atrocities have been justified under the rubric of Israel's right to defend itself? D do states not defend themselves anyway? Do they need to apply for permission at some international tribunal? This whole note, this abstract notion of the right to defend itself is usually just used as a disguise and a distraction. And the biggest one of all, you know, we talk about the aggressor. Who was the aggressor in the Iraq war? Was Saddam Hussein the aggressor? First, it was waged for self-defense because he had all these weapons of mass destruction. And then when we realized that actually he, he didn't have any of those weapons of mass destruction, it was fought for perhaps the biggest abstraction and the biggest lie of all, which is democracy. Saddam Hussein was a dictator, therefore it was progressive to overthrow him so that the Iraqi people could have democracy. What good did it do them? They had a constitution that was written by American advisors which explicitly opened up the country's oil wealth to foreign investment. Was that, was that democracy? Where is the democracy in Iraq now? The country has basically disintegrated between various different powers. And, um, and now we're told Ukraine is fighting for democracy. Not just, not just Ukrainian democracy, democracy everywhere. But the day before the invasion, the European Union said that Ukraine can't ever join the European Union because it's too vulnerable to, for state capture. State capture is code for the state is run by a few mafia oligarchs and there is no democratic government in Ukraine. That's what they recognized the day before the invasion. But of course, then the invasion took place and we've all got to support democracy in Ukraine. Don't you know there's a war on? This is how they operate. But to be honest, I don't want to spend too much time on what the imperialists say, because actually, um, the, if, if it was just the imperialists and their media and their schools and so on churning all this stuff out, its effect would be relatively limited. The working class has its own organizations, it has its own traditions, and it also has its own leadership. 
The problem is, if the leadership of the working class and their organizations takes up this rhetoric to justify the war, it, then it completely confuses and paralyzes the working class. And actually, it's the biggest security the imperialists need to wage war in the first place. And this is something that Lenin called social chauvinism. And perhaps the classical expression of this is the German SPD. It wasn't just the German party, but the German Social Democratic Party in 1914 at the declaration of war. And I have a quote from the SPD just to give you a bit of a laboratory example of social chauvinism. This is what the, a party based on Marxism said. Much is at stake for, for our people and its future. If Russian despotism stained with the blood of its own people should be the victor, the danger must be averted. The civilization and independence, that one again, of our people must be safeguarded. In the hour of danger, we will not desert our fatherland. And then, so that's pretty much straightforward chauvinism. Here's the social part. In this, we feel that we stand in harmony with the international, which has always recognized the right of every people to its national independence, as we stand in agreement with the international in emphatically denouncing every war of conquest. I should add that it was Germany that declared war on Russia in this particular case. It was, it was a cynical disguise to basically but just pre present the exact same line as the imperialists, but directly into the heart of the labor movement. And it had a, an extremely reactionary impact. But that's the, um, that's, uh, and they're just as cynical today. I'd give you one classical example. Hillary Benn gave a very famous speech in support of bombing ISIS in Syria. I think it was 2015. The party line under Corbyn was not to support it. He stood up and gave the following speech. He said, given that such action would be lawful, and I'll try to do my impression of it, under Article 51 of the UN Charter, because every state has the right to defend itself, why would we not uphold the settled will of the United Nations? Did they uphold the settled will of the United Nations when they invaded Iraq? No. Did he support that war? Yes. Um, and, and of course we should give humanitarian aid, and of course we should offer shelter to more refugees, including in this country, whichever, which other country are they going to put them in? Rwanda. <laughs> and of course we should commit to play our full part in helping to rebuild Syria when the war is over. How is that going? And then here's, here's an extra socialist veneer. As a party, we have always been defined by our internationalism, and we are here faced by fascists. And what we know about fascists is that they need to be defeated. And it is why, as we have heard tonight, socialists and trade unionists and others joined the International Brigade in the 1930s to fight against Franco. Invoking the International Brigades, which he would have not supported in the 30s if he were alive, in order to send bombers to drop bombs on ISIS. Um, this is the same moderate rebels that they were supporting previously against the regime. Now, of course, they're sending lots of arms to fascist militias and fascist uh, militaries, uh, you know, paramilitary groups in Ukraine in order to fight against so-called fascism of the, uh, the Russian state. This is what we see with the imperialists and the shows for chauvinists. It's like they, they, they operate on the principles not so much of Karl Marx, but Groucho Marx. Here are my principles. If you don't like them, I've got others. Because they understand, they're, they're clever enough to understand that they can deploy these whenever they want for any war they want. The problem is, I mentioned the right-wing reformists, but there is a distinction to be drawn between the left and the right. There is a struggle that goes on between the left and the right. Let's not lump them together. And the fundamental distinction on war between the right reformists and the left reformists is the right reformists simply repeat the lies of the imperialists, whereas unfortunately the left actually believe them. And that actually makes it more dangerous, I would say. And to give just an example of that, I often give the example of Owen Jones. I've got nothing against the guy, but he tends to be quite a, an adequate example of left reformism. He tweeted, anti-war doesn't mean being uh, sorry, pacifist. In the case of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, it means opposing Russia's war of aggression, that one again, which means supporting Ukraine's armed struggle of liberation against it and supporting a military defeat. He then went on to clarify that, yes, this is a principle that applies in all cases. Wherever you have an aggressor, you oppose the aggressor. And so he said, on that basis, I also oppose Saudi Arabia in Yemen. He's not calling for the British state to arm the Yemeni uh, people. He's not calling for defeat to Saudi Arabia. He's simply saying, no, this isn't a bad idea. Also, this isn't a good idea, sorry. He did oppose the war in Iraq. Let's give him credit for that. But he didn't say victory to Saddam, did he? And he didn't call on neutral countries like France to arm the Iraqi army. It's this sort of, it, it's, it's less a kind of cynicism and more a kind of hopeless opportunism, which I would say is actually more reactionary in its effects, at least, than the deliberate chauvinism of the right, because it completely decapitates and confuses the workers' movement at the outbreak of the war. And if you do that, you give the imperialists a free hand to do whatever they want, usually amplifying the horrors of the war and actually making a, a, you know, a democratic or progressive peace less likely, not more likely. And the blame for that has to lie at the, at the feet of the leaders of the labor movement. Now, I'll get on to what Marxists should put forward, and I think I need to hurry up, so apologies. But the first thing is that the Marxist position, as you can probably gather, is not predetermined by abstractions like who is the aggressor, you know, and simply the right of nations to self-determination, which we do defend as a democratic right. 
But nor is it a pacifist position. We don't oppose war simply on a pacifist basis. First of all, there are wars that we would support, you know, revolutionary wars of national liberation and obviously the wars of a worker state against imperialism, we would support. And I'll say more about this in a moment. But also, but mainly, pacifism actually seeks to return things to the same unbearable point they were at, but they're at the war. That, that, that things had reached before the war. They basically said, oh, can we, not, can we not go back to the Minsk agreement in relation to Ukraine? Can we not basically just pull all the pieces back to where they were at the beginning of February this year? Well, what do they think is going to happen? Surely the whole situation is going to replay again if we could turn back time. It's, it's, a, it's more utopian than calling for uh, you know, workers' revolution, which we're often attacked for. Um, but some perhaps more intelligent, more consistent pacifists don't so much say, well, let's just go back to how it was. They say, OK, well, let's settle this in a democratic way. Let's, everything should be solved democratically by referenda in the different regions, by free elections, the demobilization of the fascist uh, units. I mean, I'd agree all, with all that. But what they say, on what basis is that supposed to be achieved? They never, they never clarify that. They think the people who are supposed to be demobilizing the fascists are Zelensky in Ukraine, NATO and Putin. That's not going to happen, is it? They're basically saying that imperialism should cease to be imperialism. And that's an interesting point. How can imperialism cease to be imperialism? Imperialism can only cease to be imperialism if it is an overthrown by the working class, which is the only force in society capable of overthrowing it. And so that means that actually the pro a progressive, genuine end to war, the only way to struggle for a meaningful, permanent peace is to strive for the overthrow of capitalism in any one of the belligerent imperialist powers. Um, and this, this is where we come to the question of principles, because we, we okay, we're not, we're not bound by these kind of simply purely abstract principles where you almost mathematically deduce or as simple as, okay, well, who was the aggressor? Where we're going to follow it. The entire policy just comes straight from that. We don't have such easy shortcuts. But it's not the case to say that we have no principles. We don't just proceed in a purely empirical sense, which would usually mean actually supporting our own imperialists. Our principles, the principles of Marxism, are fundamentally a guide to action. They're not a cookbook that was somehow written before the beginning of time and before war even came into being, some moral code. They are principles derived from the real experience of the working class. And the fundamental principle at, at, place, at play here is that, pro, that of proletarian internationalism and class independence. Because, that, because, of course, what are our principles? The fight for socialism. And without these two things, socialism is impossible. A good uh, quote that gives us the, this principle, I would say, is in the Communist Manifesto. In the national struggles of the proletarians of the different countries, the communists point out and bring to the front the common interest of the entire proletariat, independently of all nationality. What this means in practice under, under imperialism is that the Marxist policy, who we support or don't support, the position we take in any given war, is fundamentally determined by the impact, the place of that war in the global struggle to overthrow capitalism. It's a concrete question guided by the principles of class independence and inter genuine proletarian uh, um, internationalism. And an example of this can, ironically, ironically, you might think, be found in the Second International itself, in a resolution of 1907, drafted by Rosa Luxemburg, which said, you know, the, pe the people in the imperialist countries could tell that war was coming. In case war should break out, it is their duty, as in the socialists, to intervene in favor of its speedy termination and with all their powers to utilize, this is the key part, the economic and political crisis created by the war to arouse the people and thereby hasten the downfall of capitalist class rule. Not simply appeal for arbitration, not support one imperialist power against the other, because, oh, maybe, maybe German capitalism is slightly more progressive than uh, Russian imperialism, but actually to convert the formulation that Lenin used is to convert the imperialist war into a civil war. What he meant by civil war is the war of the working class to, uh, against the capitalist class, a revolution, a workers' revolution. So rather than softening or suspending the class struggle at home, almost saying, okay, well, we'll, we'll pick this up again after the war, but for, for now we're going to fight together, it should actually, the role of Marxists should be to intensify the class struggle during the war, to drive a wedge between the workers and the belligerent imperialist capitalists in their own country and eventually mobilize the workers for the seizure of power as soon as is genuinely possible. Not just trying to launch a general strike out of nowhere, but actually to work towards the seizure of power by the workers. Now, obviously, all but the parties I mentioned betrayed that in the Second International, but that pr principle still remains. And what, 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 what this means in the first place, speaking a bit more practically, is we must always tell the truth. And I know that seems really obvious and, and, and easy to say, or we must tell the truth, but actually it's an incredibly difficult thing to do in the midst of imperialist war, where you're not even sure what the truth is on the ground. That means that our first duty is to point to the lies, hypocrisy, the machinations, and the real intentions of our imperialists at home. And, and it's, it, that's the only way that we can give the workers the clearest picture 
of the real international and national situation in order to prepare them for the struggle of power. If we deprive them of that, there will be no working class independent movement. Class independence is based on having a true evaluation of the facts. But what also flows from this is what Lenin calls the policy of revolutionary defeatism, which I think has been often quoted but often misunderstood. During World War I, the internationalists were reduced to a rump and under a huge amount of pressure to support at least the kind of defense of their own com uh, countries, kind of this kind of defenseless pressure. Lenin very firmly opposed this. He actually said, the defeat of one's own government would be the lesser evil. And he wrote, he wrote further, during a reactionary war, like the First World War, a revolutionary class cannot but desire the defeat of its own government. But here's some clarification is required. Does that mean that a Marxist should simply support the victory of the other side? So should the British Marxists be calling for victory for Putin? And should the Russian Marxists right now be calling for the victory for Zelensky and NATO? I think that would be an absurd position. It wouldn't be internationalism, would it? To have the various different sections basically calling for each other's defeat. It would be an, it would be an inverted chauvinism, wouldn't it? It would, it would be almost trying to escape the thorny problem of an internationalist position by just saying, oh, well, the, the, let the other ones win. That would be a blow against our own, own imperialism. Um, and, and Lenin never called for victory for Germany. In fact, in an article, he wrote, the, he explicitly criticized the idea that desiring Russia's defeat means desiring the victory of Germany. So the defeat of Russia is still the lesser evil, but he's not actually desiring the work, victory of Germany. Because of course, the victory of German imperialism over Russia would not have progressive ramifications. It wouldn't actually liberate uh, the Poles, for example. So what he meant was that the workers of any and all the imperialist states must strive to convert this war, uh, the imperialist war, into a civil war, like the Paris Commune. And what that means is you continue revolutionary agitation against your own government, you mobilize the workers on an independent basis, and you raise demands which, if anything, hamper the discipline of the army, if that's a relevant consideration, in favor of the working class, and aim towards the conquest of power, such, such as the Bolshevik agitation in the trenches in 1917. Now, what kind of effect did the democratic agitation of the Bolsheviks in the trenches in 1917 have on the army? It had a disastrous um, effect from the standpoint of the Russian general staff and the waging of the war, but I would say it had a very good effect from the standpoint of the working class because it contributed directly to the seizure of power in one of the imperialist countries. And Trotsky summed up this policy when he said, military defeat resulting from the growth of the revolutionary movement is infinitely more beneficial to the proletariat and to the whole people than military victory assured by civil peace. In other words, what it's the lesser evil compared to is not simply the victory of German imperialism or Russian imperialism or NATO imperialism. It's the lesser evil compared to the mobilization of an independent workers movement capable of ending the war on a socialist basis. If building that movement makes it harder for your state to fight the war and makes it more likely it will lose, then so be it. That's the position, which when you think about it is simply a consistent revolutionary socialist position. All it means is, all it demands on us is that we continue our revolutionary agitation, we build for the conquest of power, and not postpone it until after the war. And Trotsky quotes Karl Liebknecht, he, he described it as an unsurpassed formula of proletarian policy in time of war. The chief enemy of the people is in its own country. Now, I'm, I'm now going to engage in a bit of hypothetical speculation. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I would ask the question. If within the Ukrainian army, I don't know, more working class units start to actually mobilize themselves more on a class basis, if they take steps to try and disarm the fascists within their own ranks, even if they start trying to seize the property of some of the oligarchs, and I'm not suggesting any of that is really happening. I'm presenting a hypothetical. But if that were actually to take place, what impact would that have on the war effort? I think that would have a terrible impact on the plans of Zelensky and NATO and on the, the, the defense of the Ukrainian state as it exists. And therefore, it would have a terrible impact on the defense of Ukrainian sovereignty and democracy and Christian civilization and all those things. And I say good, because it would have a very good impact on the consciousness of workers, not just in Ukraine, but worldwide. And it would actually raise the possibility of a, of a workers' revolution. And you can apply exactly the same logic to Russia. If the, if the proletarian anti-war movement in Russia gains traction independent of the liberal kind of pro-Western wing, which is completely discrediting the movement. And again, I'm not trying to point to, you know, I'm, I'm presenting a hypothetical here, but if, if the, 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 the anti-war movement and the working class movement in, in uh, Russia had an independent position and actually started reaching out to, uh, to soldiers on both sides, would that have a good impact on Putin's fight against fascism? I think it would have a detrimental impact. It would actually be demoralizing the soldiers, but it would be doing it from a working class basis, which would be a progressive outcome. And this is something that we should, we should look towards and support where we find it. But we mustn't be utopians. I'm putting forward those examples just to try and clarify the theoretical point. I'm not aware of evidence of that happening on the ground. If it does, if it does develop, then we should support that and foster that, but we can't do that. How do we support the, what I mean by the working class anti-war movement in Russia, 
which I think is the task of internationalists. How can we do that if we are saying, if we are giving support for NATO and Ukraine in its war for democracy? How can we do that if we're demanding that our government, a Tory government or a Labour government, sends as much weapons to Ukraine as possible? In what way are we reaching out to the Russian working class against the war and against their own regime, let alone supporting sanctions, which only affect, you know, mainly attack the workers? But it's not just that it's reactionary to attack the workers anyway, but it's also you are driving sections of the Russian workers towards the Putin regime. Because when they see Western imperialism placing sanctions on you and arming people with Volsangles angles on their arm, then what conclusions are they supposed to draw? I think it's a perfectly justifiable conclusion for them to draw the conclusion that this is an international pro-fascist attack on Russia as a whole. And that's precisely the kind of mood that Putin is trying to draw from. Why should we contribute? Shouldn't we be trying to undermine that with genuine working class solidarity? And this brings me to another important point. How do we show working class internationalist solidarity? I feel like the word solidarity has been worn out in the last few months. I hear it all the time. First of all, solidarity is not the same as sympathy. But also, how on earth can you give solidarity to the workers of another country through your own imperialist state? How on earth does that work? I, I've, I've lived long enough. I don't think you have to live very long to know this, to be honest, but I've lived long enough to see this happen many, many times. When Gaddafi, when the revolution broke out against Gaddafi, Gaddafi was unsurprisingly attacking and killing his opponents, and leftists in Britain said, people are dying. We need a no-fly zone to stop people dying. So they got a no-fly zone, and where, is, where are they now? Where is Libya now? Libya doesn't exist. There is no Libyan state. It's descended to completely into barbarism run by warlords with slave markets on the African coast. So that's, that's the benefit that they gain from Western solidarity. How about the, the uh, you know, the... Um in Afghanistan, the brave freedom fighters of the Mujahideen against Soviet occupation. Don't, not my words, the word of Rambo III, by the way, and the Reagan government. They needed arms, didn't they, for their freedom fight? They got them, and where, where were we now? I'll, I'll let you make your mind up about the situation today in Afghanistan. Or Syria. You know, the, 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 the revolution breaks out against the Assad regime and the Tory government starts giving aid and solidarity to the so-called moderate rebels. That's what they called them in those days, the moderate rebels, the moderate jihadis, who, of course, basically just blended into ISIS at the end of the day. And then we started bombing them, too. The point is that imperialist solidarity is not the working class, working class solidarity. Imperialism is incapable of achieving anything progressive by its, own, by its own means at all. That means that the working class can never rely on the imperialist state to give aid or solidarity to any people. I, 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 you know, even in a war, and I don't have time to go into depth about them for, into these, unfortunately, but even in a war where Marxists would actually support, you know, a genuine war of national liberation. Now, I've seen some people trying to justify the NATO war effort by reference to this being some kind of colonial war of liberation fought by Ukraine against Russian imperialism. I think some of you might have attended the session on the Ukrainian national question. Maybe that's confronted this. I'm very conscious of time. I will limit myself to saying I think that that claim is highly dubious. I don't think this is a revolutionary war of national liberation against Russian imperialism. I think that this is a, a regime that can't even negotiate peace independently without the say-so of the NATO powers, who will probably negotiate that peace independently of whatever Zelensky and his regime works at once. It's a corrupt oligarchic regime, which is basically the front. It's a battlefield for a war between NATO and Russia. This is imperialist war. If, and I would say, if, if I'm wrong, and some of these so-called Marxists who say it is a colonial war of liberation that has to be supported by imperialist means are right, then I would say that the Bolsheviks were wrong in 1914. Because what they should have been doing in that case is supporting Serbia's heroic um, fight for national liberation against Austria and the Bosnian, Bosnians against Austria by supporting Tsarist Russia, who of course was fighting for the liberation of all Slavs. Nobody I've met actually thinks that. But we need to apply a similar method um, to today, I would say. The chief enemy of its own people, of the people is in its own country. Um, and, um, and, and, but I, I, this, that wasn't even the most important point in relation to this. The most important thing that I wanted to bring up is Trotsky says something I think extremely important for us to remember. In the run-up to World War II, he said, yes, it's an imperialist war. Nowadays, people talk about World War II as like it's, it's purely a just war simply because it was against fascism. That's not the case. It was an imperialist war for the redivision of the, uh, of the globe. Trotsky said it's a continuation of the last war, and our policy should be a continuation and intensification of the same policy of revolutionary defeatism, however, applied to the real concrete facts. And those facts contained the defense of the Soviet Union against fascism, but also the possibility of colonial wars of liberation, such as in India, for example, breaking out in the midst of the war. And he said, if that were to take place, and the imperialists, for their own reasons, gave support, for example, Britain being allied with the Soviet Union, they're still imperialists, but he said, should workers blockade arms being sent, say, from Britain to the USSR, or from fascist Italy to Algeria? He said, no, that would be pointless. In what sense is that you know, helping the world revolution? 
But I've seen that used to justify positively calling on your own imperialists to send arms. That's not what you're talking about. He was putting forward a fairly sensible, practical, negative position. And what he said further, which really sums it up, is the workers of imperialist countries, however, cannot help an anti-imperialist country through their own government, no matter what might be the diplomatic and military relations between the two countries at a given moment. If the governments find themselves in a temporary and by the very essence of the matter, unreliable alliance, then the proletariat of the imperialist country continues to remain in class opposition to its own government and supports the non-imperialist ally, his own quotation marks, through its own methods. In other words, through the methods of the international class struggle, agitation not only against their perfidious allies, in other words, agitating against the lies and machinations of this case, British imperialism, but also in favour of a worker state in the colonial country, boycott strikes in one case, rejection of boycott and strikes in another case. In other words, the principle continues to be the same, simply applied to the real conditions, the principles of class independence, first and foremost, and genuine proletarian internationalism. We support the workers of other countries by our own means. Um, the imperialists, thank you, sorry. The imperialists are simply incapable. Even if you think that they are defending a progressive cause or they're slightly more progressive than others, they are simply incapable of providing peace. Their peace, I'm reminded of a quote from Tacitus, the ancient Roman historian. He said, they create a wilderness and call it peace. That's the kind of peace that imperialism creates. The Soviet Union actually instructed parties in India, the Communist Party in India, basically suspended the independence struggle against Britain. Why? Because Britain was fighting fascism. But surely if the Indian people wanted to fight fascism, they need to start with British occupation and the British Raj, which Trotsky explained at the time. The British Communist Party banned strikes, basically, didn't support strikes within Britain. In Mexico, communists supported the popular front, the anti-fascist front, with American imperialism. In Mexico, who was the bigger enemy to the Mexican workers' cl working class? Hitler or Roosevelt? It was American imperialism. And actually, by suspending the class struggle and strengthening the Western imperialists, who were their allies at that time, it meant that the end of the world, uh, Second World War was the most brutal, inhumane, d disgusting that it could possibly have been, you know, the dropping of nuclear weapons on Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and so on, firebombing of German cities. But also, it guaranteed the future encirclement of the USSR. All of a sudden, their allies, surprise, surprise, turned again into imperialist countries that wanted to encircle and destroy the USSR. So actually, the USSR found itself in a, a, a would have found itself in a much weakened position if it hadn't been for the, the spread of the revolution um, to other countries. But even then, ultimately, it had grave consequences for the workers' movement. Even the Comintern itself was dissolved in 1943 in order to satisfy its so-called anti-fascist allies, who then, when German uh, fascism was overthrown, they kept Nazis in the government, they kept the emperor in imperial Japan and many fascists in the government there, and actually they put pressure on French capitalism to evict the Communist Party by withdrawing martial aid. So the, 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 the Soviet Union actually managed to weaken its position. And I'll, I'll finish here because uh, Alberta is looking increasingly worried. <laughs> what now? I've talked, I've talked quite a lot about principles and you know, guides to action and so on. What, what now? What does this mean now? And I just wanted to refer to an article I read in Navarra Media where it was saying we need a robust anti-war movement in this country, talking about the role of British imperialism in actually preventing a peace and pushing Ukraine towards a further prolongation, exacerbation of the conflict. And I, I agree with that. One point I would, a side I would make is, it's only now they're publishing this article. They would not have published that article in February or March when it was all about solidarity with Ukraine. The difference is now the cracks are beginning to show. Winter is coming, to coin a phrase, and many of the European powers are starting to worry about social explosions in their own countries, and so they would much rather see a deal. So now the left reformists in Britain are starting to talk about the need for an anti-war movement. I would say, when we need an anti-war movement, is before the war breaks out and during the war, not, not when it's actually started. But the real point I want to make, and the really important question that this person raises, is why isn't there one already? We have two million people out on the streets in opposition to the Iraq war. Where has that movement gone? What has happened to it? And this tells us something about that an anti-war movement, a genuine anti-war movement, cannot be built in isolation from the class struggle. It takes more than anti-war slogans to bring together a movement strong enough to resist the pressure of imperialism, which is incredibly strong. And the basis for such a movement could only ever lie in a genuinely independent, revolutionary wing, I would say a Marxist wing, of the British Labour movement. It's interesting that one of the very few unions who put out a statement criticising NATO at the onset of the war was Unison, only because there was a Marxist on the NEC of Unison that happened to be on the committee that drafted that document. That's a small example of the very small things that could be achieved with small forces. But this is a point. The reason that the anti-war movement is so small is because that genuine class independent revolutionary wing of the labor movement is extremely small. So actually, if we want to build a working class anti-war movement that bases itself on class independence and proletarian internationalism, we need to build that revolutionary wing of the British labor movement here in Britain, obviously, and worldwide. On that, I'll finish. Thank you.